Hello, everyone. My name is Bruce Baer, Dean of the University of Washington College of Forest Resources. And on behalf of the entire college, I wish to welcome all of you to this three-part lecture series entitled Sustaining Our Northwest World, Tales from the Forest. Our intent in this series is to highlight the dynamic balance required to meet the growing natural resource needs of society while sustaining the environmental, economic, and cultural values we associate with our region's urban and wildland resources. This lecture series is a companion to the college's Denman Forestry Issues series, also seen here on UWTV, and both series contribute to the college's vision of world-class leadership in sustaining natural resources and environmental services throughout the region and beyond in order to improve the lives of future generations while satisfying the needs of people today. Using objective science to address our complex and contentious natural resource issues is a necessary but by no means a sufficient condition for finding balanced solutions. We must also properly recognize and incorporate economic, social, and cultural values into the policy formation and decision-making processes. In essence, all three values, environmental, economic, and social cultural must be considered to achieve a balanced, sustainable solution that ensures the proper stewardship of our natural resources. We are pleased to present this lecture series in partnership with the University of Washington Alumni Association. We are also grateful for the support of the Rachel A. Woods Endowment, which is underwriting a portion of this series and to members of the college's Dean's Club for their financial support. I encourage each of you to contact the college at www.cfr.washington.edu to explore the broad nature of natural resource issues that we are studying and to learn how our college plans to educate the next generation of natural resource scientists and leaders while creating and leveraging new technology to sustain our Northwest world. Today we are fortunate to hear from a nationally recognized expert who deals with a critical area of forest management, the science of forest entomology, which is the study of forest insects. University of Washington College of Forest Resources Professor Robert Guerra will discuss the role insects play as one of the most important agents of disturbance in our forest, along with fire, wind, and disease. Acting together, these four disturbances impact forest ecosystems in many ways beyond the obvious damage they cause to many natural resources such as changing species composition of our forest, changing successional patterns of vegetation, changing forest structures, and changing levels of biodiversity. Issues related to the role insects play in the evolution and management of our forest in North America are not new, having been investigated since the 1880s. Yet, finding the most appropriate ways to sustain the health of our forest remains a very contentious issue as we enter the 21st century. Effective forest management practices require social acceptance and trust in the many communities and user groups interested in forest stewardship and health. Finding balanced, sustainable solutions aided by objective science provides the proper approach to the eventual solution. Now, to discuss this important topic, I wish to introduce Professor Robert Guerra, who will speak on the topic of insects and ecosystems. Welcome, colleagues, friends, all of you. I'm going to talk about um, pretty much what the dean said, but in a different way. I'm going to talk about a trajectory in forest entomology. I'm going to be doing this by looking back on a uh, very long profession. 
Um, talk about a change um, in terms of what one will talk about, this certainly is it. It's difficult for me not to talk about what I do best. I really like to talk about, and, uh, and all the time do talk about, understanding interactions between insects and their host trees. In fact, uh, look at your program. Uh, that's what I was going to talk about. Um, I still will talk about that, but um, quite a bit differently. And the reason that I've changed my talk in midstream, so to speak, is that the other day I was giving a talk to my class in forest entomology, and all of a sudden uh, a light hit me, a realization hit me. Um, in fact, I was doing what I love to do best. I was explaining, uh, there's the word again, interactions uh, between the western spruce budworm and the landscape. And all of a sudden I realized the explanation that I was given the class had an awful lot to do with personal history. Um, it's really this personal thread that links the past with now that's going to be my subject. Um, in fact, that's the big advantage, perhaps the only one, but the big advantage <laughs> of being an old timer in the sense that I've lived through this. I've lived through my profession. And that's what I want to highlight. Um, there it is, the light that hit me. <laughs> in fact, uh, one of the basic questions that uh, I will pose to you is, do we really choose our profession? Or does the profession really choose us? Um, well, for openers, um, I was born in Chile, of all places. And in fact, uh, grew up in this beautiful country, in that beautiful country, till I was about uh, 10 years old. And um, in the 1930s, it was the thing to do, it was common, to send kids to summer camp, right? Um, I, I don't know if it was really a custom, or perhaps in my case, perhaps I was a brat. But uh, as long as I lived in Chile, every summer, for three months, my parents sent me off um, to summer camp in Chile. In fact, they sent me to a summer camp called uh, Nido de Aguilas, which means uh, eagle's nest. Uh, there it is, a beautiful place to send your kid. And uh, there's a typical uh, bedroom in the A-frame that uh, we all lived in. Now, the thing is that the plywood on the walls of this bedroom had these, um, these kind of patterns etched into the material. And I'm sure this rings a bell. When you were nine years old, and uh, you know, we were trying to get to sleep somewhere, uh, wouldn't you have looked at these etchings and said, well, that looks like a dragon. Uh, that looks like a cloud. Uh, one remembers this sort of thing, right? Um, well, I still remember that. As a matter of fact, um, 40 years later, uh, when I returned to Chile as a professional forest entomologist, I learned that these etchings were caused by the larvae of a tiny little moth. In fact, um, imagine that. As a forest entomologist, you can find that thread, this, at least in this case, that binds a nine-year-old boy with a profession some 40 years later. In fact, here's the actual publication that we wrote um, on that uh, cause of the etchings, that little moth. Well, so I would then ask, is this simply fate? Um, well, no, it's not. It's not just fate that forges that thread. It's also, it has a lot to do with the professional education that one has. And again, good fortune. In my case, the good fortune was studying forest management at Utah State University, where we had a handful of magnificent professors. Um, the one on the left, a real taskmaster from the old school. Well, this was 50 years ago. What's an, what's an old school? I mean, a medieval school. <laughs> um, that was really tough. But boy, you learned your civil culture, you learned your dendrology. In the middle was a gentle but very fine professor that taught, that taught the forest management subjects. 
And on the far right is a professor, um, Professor Ross Tosher, um, who not only was a fantastic mentor for all we young students at the time, but he has remained as a, one of the best friends that I have. And he's here, Ross Tosher, after all these years. <laughs> so I, I recognize him not only for the Utah State uh, students, but those from the University of Michigan as well. He has a very, very large following. Well, let me talk a little bit about some other steps that I've had and others have had that forged that thread. Um, in the 1950s, uh, when I worked as a forest manager, um, foresters at that time practiced their conviction that a growing nation needed lumber produced in a sustainable fashion. It was not just jargon, it was a fact. This was uh, the, high, the, the heyday of the sustained yield notion. In my own case, I worked for Kirby Lumber Corporation. Uh, this was a company that practiced uh, very intensive sustained yield management, uh, very much by the books. It was set up by a, a famous professor of forestry. Um, and I was very fortunate to be a forester in this company. And then uh, in the middle of my profession, there was a huge sawfly infestation, a sawfly infestation. Um, and obviously, uh, with this kind of destruction going on, you just can't practice sustained yield management if your crop is cropped off, right? Uh, it goes to a to an insect in this case. So that was again an introduction to uh, entomology. In those days, you know, back in the 50s, forest managers tried to solve problems by directly confronting them. And in fact, my, my boss, a siliculturist for the company, said, OK, Bob, you join a group and you solve this problem. So a railway skidway was cleared of logs. Crop dusters were hired from the rice fields of East Texas to spray the sawfly outbreak with, of all things, DDT. This was 1950s now. Um, so here's a set of slides on the Kirby Lumber Corporation's spraying operation against the black-headed sawfly in 1958. There's that thread again. That you know, goes back to 1930. In fact, here's a photo of the spray planes uh, spewing out uh, insecticide on Kirby's forests, lining up on the smoke that we created. In this case, we, we marked the boundaries of our spraying operation by equipping Caterpillar tractors with a spray tank to inject diesel oil into the manifold of the, uh, of the Caterpillar tractor. Then by revving up the engine, you can see it produce smoke. These are the sort of problems that you solved uh, back in those days. Now, on the third day uh, after the spraying operation, a virus epizootic, that means a virus outbreak, wiped out the entire sawfly population, population <laughs> right across the countryside. In other words, when we took the data right after the spraying on the second day, it looked like a great success. There were no other sawflies, but then the whole population uh, collapsed on the third day. Every last insect died. Now, understanding the links between the population dynamics of the black-headed sawfly and the virus was the fascinating issue that we, of course, didn't know at the time. The point here is that at the beginning of an outbreak, you have a normal distribution in terms of susceptibility of the sawfly population to the virus. In other words, um, many of the sawflies died at a very low concentration of the virus, but there were these ones over here that were quite resistant. Then as another year went by, the population was selected again. In this case, for resistance. So there were few insects left but they were highly resistant to the outbreak. This is, of course, when the outbreak collapsed. But these few individuals were the seed corn for the next outbreak that would have occurred many years in the future. So that 
the, the point is, uh, if you look at those years in the future, this great resistance to the, to the virus gradually changed as it was disadvantageous to the population to maintain uh, all their energy and resistance, gradually changed back to a normal population, which would have been the beginning of another outbreak somewhere else. But of course, we didn't know this. We thought spraying would solve the problem. Of course, the point is this. If you're going to teach forest entomology, how wonderful it is to have made mistakes based on professional principles of that particular time. How wonderful it is to understand now, today, some of the infinite subtleties that govern population dynamics, in this case, of saw flies. We'll come back to these two points later on. How wonderful it is to be able to pass the information that you live through uh, to others. Also, during the time I was working with Kirby Lumber Corporation, 1957 on, uh, we had a huge southern pine beetle outbreak and another disturbance that wipes out the forest. You can see here how a southern pine beetle spot will start where the trees are being killed by this insect. You come back a few days later and you can see that the spot has increased dramatically. You can come back in a week or two weeks and as far as you can see, you see nothing but dead pine trees. All this gray you see here are dead pine trees. All the green are hardwood trees. They encompass the entire landscape. Well, the way we confronted this problem is we would fly over the, the company's holdings. We would locate the spots. We would then map them, send a ground crew in, and they would then cut down these trees and spray the trees with the pesticides. Well, the idea was if you found every single spot across the landscape and sprayed every tree that was infested, wouldn't that control the spot? Wouldn't that control the outbreak across the landscape? Well, we thought that, but we were wrong, of course. So during the 1960s, later on, once I was a forest entomologist, we went back and studied the host selection behavior to better understand how the southern pine beetles find their host. You need to do that before you can even think about controlling populations. And understanding their behaviors involved research, of course. So look at the sort of things we did to really understand what this insect was doing. We set up trapping devices. Uh, trees all over our research area had these uh, motorized insect nets. So we knew exactly how many insects per square foot of air we were sampling. We would have them at all different heights. We would have random trapping devices that were plexiglass where the insects would hit their heads and fall on a trough of water. So in this way, we knew uh, the, the pattern of dispersal of the insects through the forest. We also studied how these insects respond to attractants. Um, they put out a, an aggregating pheromone so they can find their hosts. So we put uh, these devices up in the uh, canopy and we measured out the southern pine beetle attractant uh, into these devices so we could see how high they flew, how, how they dispersed in terms of height through the forest. Here we had this device where we put logs infested recently with the southern pine beetle in this, in this can. Here's a, here's a uh, fan that then wafted the tract and laden out through this funnel. Insects thinking this is a tree then that's freshly infested would, would hit themselves on this plexiglass, fall in the funnel, and then be collected and sampled. So this is, this is what, what we did. We took apart the host selection behavior of the insect in this fashion, finally coming up with a scheme. And, we, and it, it took us several years, but we figured out this is the way it works. If this is the southern pine beetles in the spring, they emerge from their broods and fly randomly, randomly in a dispersal flight at first through the forest. Then there are pioneering female beetles that locate tr susceptible trees, those trees that won't pitch them out or won't harm them. 
These pioneering females then put out this very powerful attractant, this pheromone, which is now felt by the flying population. They then direct their flight, they now have a cue, they now have a beacon, and then the population mass attacks the tree. And this, we had to figure this out first before there was any hope of controlling southern pine beetle outbreaks. We also knew now why our past 1950s kind of a control was nonsense, because we were always one step behind what the population was doing. You have to join them and then figure out where a weak link is, not just simply using insecticides. Okay, so let me uh, round up what I've mentioned already. I mentioned um, how history and profession are both held together by a thread of commonality. For instance, in the 1930s, um, while observing etches in the wall of a cabin uh, made by tiny insects, this kind of started the profession. The 1950s, forest insects, sustainable forestry uh, became very important. In the early 1960s, we actually studied forest insect behavior. Well, let me go back even earlier, way earlier. Um, in the 19, early 1950s, this thread already began to make its presence known to this very day, to the class I taught, I taught two days ago. That's why I changed all this uh, talk. I'm going to now focus my talk on this recent experience. Um, but to do that, I had to go back to 1951 to 53. I used to fight forest fires in Idaho and Oregon as a smoke jumper. Um, and uh, what I can do uh, because of this experience, I can tell you what it was like then. I can tell you what the forests were like then, back in the early 1950s. Um, here's, here's some slides I took back then. Uh, typical dry side western fires that we had then. Most of them were backing fires that were fuel limited. They just crawled down the mountainsides, uh, removing as they went the true fir understory. True fir is, of course, a species of tree. It's a shade tolerant tree. And hardly touching, uh, and the, uh, hardly touching the fire tolerant ponderosa pine. These are the ponderosa pine, but these slow moving fires uh, removed the true fir understory. I can remember that. You all read about it now, but I remember it. Uh, here's the slide I took on the Rooster Creek Fire of 1951. It's what you read about, but here's the slide of it that I took. Here are the ponderosa pine trees, and here are the dead true firs. That's what these fires used to do. So uh, if you look at a ponderosa forest, 1950s, uh, you would see these wide open stands with ponderosa pine with their thick bark there, resistant to fires. 1970s, as fire control, fire suppression got better and better and better, we start seeing the creep in of the firs and other late successional species of trees that are shade tolerant. So if we look at this in 1990s, we can barely see the ponderosa pine, but we see layers upon layers of true firs. That's now. That's then, as I remember it. Uh, in fact, in the 1950s, early 1950s, while I was a student, we would learn about, uh, about uh, how to, how to uh, mark and log out the ponderosa pines. That was the only species that was uh, of any worth back then. Uh, Douglas fir had very little worth, and of course, firs had none whatsoever. So all we learned about was uh, how to log out the pines, so measuring keeping track of the pine trees. Uh, if you went to the Columbia River in those days, all you saw floating down the river were rafts of pine trees. That was the, the only species that had any value back then. Um, in fact, here's some old pictures from the Yakima Indian Reservation. Here's some pictures about 1925, you know, even earlier. And again, this, is, this was typical. You don't see the intrusion of shade tolerant true firs. If you look at the 1950s, however, as uh, fire suppression got better, you start seeing an intrusion of true firs and other um, late successional species. Now, these, these um, weakening old growth ponderosa pine forests, they, did, they of course were also devastated by insects. 
Now, fires wouldn't get them, but insects would, such as the western pine beetle. Look at these old photos, the western pine beetle, back, uh, well, the turn of, the, of last century. Uh, here was a control tactic, almost as dumb as ours, when we used to go after the southern pine beetle, of cutting down every infested tree, removing the bark, so then the insects would be killed as they're exposed to the heat. Um, look, look at the losses of old growth ponderosa pine to the western pine beetle from the 1930s to the uh, 1940s, so about a 10 year period. You can see that the most active uh, agent of disturbance was the western pine beetle interacting with old growth ponderosa pine trees. Of course, the western pine beetle was studied by early forest entomologists such as H.D. Hopkins who would live with a problem, live with infestation of bark beetles for months at a time, uh, illustrating everything he saw and writing tomes on the various bark beetles, mostly the western pine beetle. Here is a, a 1960s book that, that, that highlights the research of 50 years of the western pine beetle in ponderosa pine, that being the host of the insect. Here's F.P. Keene, uh, another well-known forest entomologist that figured out a system on how to mark, and how to remove uh, weakening ponderosa pine so that the insects wouldn't get them. He set up this classification system. And in fact, foresters used to use his system. Uh, the, these are the oldest trees here, but these are the, uh, the, weakest, the weakest trees are here and here. And as the trees weakened, uh, Keen would suggest take 80% of these, 100% of these, 50% of those, 100% of these, and so forth. And it worked. His system really dropped the instance of western pine beetle. The reason I talk about this is to tell you that uh, this was the dominant species in those days, not the other species. Here, here's some re a recent analysis made in, the, well, made last year. This is on the Yakima Na Nation Forest from 1914 to today, to now. Look at Ponderosa Pine. 1914, it made up uh, um, almost uh, three quarters of the species on the reservation. But by 1926, or 1936 rather, it started to drop. By 1988, it was only 30%, and today it's even less. Okay? Look at uh, Douglas fir. Uh, it, was bare, it was only 15% in 1914 and 1926, but today it's almost 30%. Look at grand fir, that species that grows in understory, I was telling you about, that shade tolerant species. It was only 5% of the forest in 1936. Today, or 1988, it was 20%, and today it's about a quarter. So we see this tremendous shift across the landscape. Now, which brings us to my main topic, the western spruce budworm. It's now the devastating defoliator of firs and Douglas fir in the, in the west. These are trees that are a major component of the forest now, as I pointed out. On the left, you see an outbreak of the western spruce budworm uh, taken a few years ago. And on the bottom right, you, uh, you see, after the devastation, uh, the, 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 the impact um, of the destructive agent after the western spruce budworm defoliation of 2004. Now. Um, look at the way that the western spruce budworm spreads. Let's just look at this part of its uh, life cycle. The moths, little tiny insignificant moths, emerge in late summer. They flit around from tree to tree. Many are carried by the wind. That's how they're dispersed. And then what they do is they send out a sexual attractant, a sexual pheromone, um, to attract the males. And after mating, each female lays about, oh, 150 eggs or so. Next spring, however, the, the, the tiny larvae uh, of the budworm crawls to the top of the tree, and there it just flings itself out. It balloons. The idea is, as it's going through the forest, ballooning with this thread of silk, I can just hear it now. Um, please allow me to land on the Douglas fir. Please, a true fir. These are the only two hope, well, these are the main hosts of this insect. Please, not a ponderosa pine, that's, that's a non-host. 
You know? So that's what they did. <laughs> that's what they do. They balloon. In fact, it reminded me of this. The, <laughs> the idea here, of course, uh, for the insect to land on a Douglas fir or a true fir, certainly not a ponderosa pine. So, fire suppression then, uh, going back to our discussion, um, has been getting better and better since the beginning of the 20th century, 1910 in fact it started. The main non-host, there's the point, the main non-host ponderosa pine was systematically logged out um, during these early decades. The big question now is, what do our forests look like today across the landscape? It's truly hard to imagine a more western spruce budworm prone forest and we did it to ourselves. What we have today are these tall Douglas fir trees right there, tall Douglas firs. Under them, multiple layers of true firs and very few pine trees. If we had a prescription on how to rear the insect and want to do it on purpose, this is the way to do it. Not only that, these various layers, layers of true firs, one layer, two layers, three layers, are what we call high quality food because these are under severe competition for water, for minerals, for nutrients. Um, so if you look at the density, as density goes up of the true firs, they produce less and less foliar chemicals, which are called allelochemics, to defend their foliage because they don't have enough energy to do so. They have barely enough energy to survive. So this is high quality food to boot for the western spruce budworm. We did it to ourselves. What to look for? Tall Douglas firs. Let me go back to this one. It's incredible, in fact. What do these tall Douglas firs do? Well, they, they're perf perfect sentinels to uh, trap the dispersing, the ballooning um, western spruce budworms. And they are the, their hosts. So as the populations build up on these tall trees, the insects just spin down to this very fine quality uh, true fir layers in the bottom. So there it is again, tall Douglas firs, multiple layers of fir understory. You can see that already defoliated. Only a sprinkling of ponderosa pine, the non-host. Look at this picture here. This is in the Yakima Reservation a couple of years ago. Here's that understory of true firs with Douglas fir in the overstory at the beginning of the season. Look at the same forest a few, a month later. These insects just rain down on these trees and we are rearing them. And even regeneration gets completely destroyed by the raining down of these uh, western spruce budworm. So if we look at western spruce budworm incidents from 1950 to now, the question is why are modern day outbreaks so severe? Well, for the reasons I've talked about. Great fire suppression, we logged out the pines, and we uh, produce lots of McDonald's for the, uh, spruce budworm, for the spruce budworm. So today, we have these very severe outbreaks, as you can see here. Um, the other overarching problem of the western spruce budworm is that outbreaks don't go away. They last a long time. Here's an 11-year outbreak um, of the uh, western spruce budworm in Oregon and in, by, also in Washington, for that matter. Um, here's a long, long outbreak of 15 years or so in Idaho and Montana. Once the outbreak gets going, it just stays in there. Uh, you can see the effects of growth, on growth, of outbreaks of the budworm. You can see the decreased growth started in 1970. And here we see the results of a seven-year outbreak as the, whole, uh, as the Douglas fir and true firs uh, uh, don't put on much growth because of the outbreak. So what happens is you clip off the new growth because that's what the insects feed on every year for many years. The upper left you see a three-year outbreak. In the middle slide you see a six-year outbreak. And finally after six years they give up their ghost. The trees start to die. Here you can see after um, eight years, nine years of an outbreak, uh, bark beetles, Douglas fir bark beetle in this case, 
starts killing the trees. Well, a recent approach, a good approach in how to manage this problem well, would be an integrated pest management approach. But the way this works is, let's say this is the economic damage level. Um, usually we, we can say this is the annual growth of the forest. Here we have the population average of the western spruce budworm. And, and here is a lower average of the, of the western spruce budworm. The idea is you have to do something. You have to come up with an idea to permanently reduce the average population level of the budworm. But in spite of what you do, the outbreak gets, gets away from you, you have to come back and think of a pesticide. So let's see if this is feasible. What can be done to restore the forest to the days of old, before fire suppression, uh, and we selectively logged out, logged out the pines? Uh, well, we want to get our forest back to some semblance the, the, uh, of this kind of a structure. Um, so this is being done in the state of Washington now, in fact, with these ideas in mind. <laughs> thin out the forest, thin the stands, get rid of those fir trees. Of course, it's logical, makes sense. Favor ponderosa pine, and if possible, gradually over the years, bring back for fire into the ecosystem. Those are the rules. Um, that's been done, thinning out the true firs. Even if it's a costly way to do that, get them out of the picture, costly using a helicopter logging, for instance, and favor ponderosa pine. Here's a case where the true firs were, were removed. Uh, some of the better Douglas firs were left, but we're starting to get back that open structure of old, certainly uh, resistant to the western spruce budworm. Where possible, fire is being brought in where the fuel allows it, and um, you can see in this slide, heavy fir mortality. That's the way it was. Now, if need be, the western spruce budworm, uh, if it's threatening, in spite of everything you did, thinning, thinning out the firs, favoring ponderosa pine, doing your controlled burns, if you still have an outbreak, you have to think of a surgical strike with a pesticide, such as Bacillus thuringiensis, which would be a biological control pesticide. Um, so judicious spraying of Bacillus thuringiensis, in this sense, does make sense. But the problem is this, you can't, you can't spray the forest and just forget about it. Here's a series of studies done by the Forest Service, which shows after spraying, the problem comes back in three or four years. So one has to treat an area with Bacillus thuringiensis, remove those multiple layers of firs right away, favoring leaving Ponderosa pine, and leaving, of course, the vigorous Douglas firs. Now, this prescription is based on a lot of history, a lot of common sense, a lot of research. It is, after all, the silvicultural plan that will permanently reduce the western spruce budworm population. In, in photo a, or diagram A, it shows the way it used to be again. Uh, open stand, um, mostly 1H class, mostly ponderosa pine, and the way it is now, or worse, you can see that you have multiple layers of the favorite hosts of this insect, Douglas fir and true fir. So the idea is to get it back the way it was. Anyway, um, after a lifetime of experience, uh, that's what I'm telling you about, research and teaching the discipline, uh, what can I conclude uh, after all of this? First conclusion would be, in my case, very definitely, forest entomology found me. No question about it. Secondly, forest entomology is an endlessly fascinating enterprise that has both basic and applied challenges for anyone entering this field. I'm unsure where forestry as I knew it, notice the past tense will go, but if there are commercial and ecological goals, either way, forest insects will find new participants in the profession. Thank you. <laughs>